Welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey, and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners, and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness, and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Hello, everyone. It's Mickey here. You're listening to Wikipedia, and this week on the podcast. I speak to Taylor Sittler, Head of Research and Development at Levels, a health app designed to interpret and make recommendations on your continuous glucose monitor readings or CGM readings. It's all about metabolic health and glucose levels this week. We talk 101 as to why it's even important to think about measuring glucose, the limitations of other markers of glucose such as fasting glucose, why it's controversial to suggest healthy people could monitor their glucose for their metabolic health, what affects your glucose levels, and there are some pretty surprising things, and much more than that. So we do a 101, but also a bit of a deep dive, and it's so good to chat to someone like Taylor who has a wealth of information in this space, and just in general in terms of his uh, previous work as a physician. Taylor is Head of Research and Development at Levels. He's a physician and entrepreneur, and his career has focused on personalizing medicine, starting companies in genetics and women's health, including co-founding Color Health, where he was Chief Scientific Officer. Prior to that, Taylor completed his residency in clinical pathology at UCS. F and started a genetics research group in the computer science department at UC Berkeley with David Patterson. Taylor received a Howard Hughes medical training grant and scholarship during medical school at the University of Massachusetts and UCSD. He has published papers on pathogen detection and characterization, genetic sequence analysis and algorithms, and several other topics related to systems biology. Taylor is such a great person to chat to about this and you can hear it the way he speaks, he's so passionate and he's also an avid skier and hiker and enjoys all things outdoors. There'll be links to Taylor and Levels and the podcast that he hosts in the show notes. But before we get into this week's conversation, I'd just like to remind you the best way to support the podcast is to hit like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. That way people are much more aware of Wikipedia. So anytime anyone subscribes, it just increases awareness of us. That would be amazing. And if you want to go that one step further, head to my website, mickeywillardin.com, sign up to the recipe portal access for 12 bucks a month. You get a weekly email from me, access to our members only Facebook page, you get the ability for me to answer your nutrition related questions and you get access to over 900 recipes which are frequently updated. I'd also like to remind you that Monday's Matter opens this week. We start the program again Monday 5th of September and that launches this week so watch out on social media or jump on my email list to find out more information about that. All right, team, I hope that you enjoy the conversation that I have with Taylor Sittler. Taylor, thank you so much for joining me this morning to chat all about blood glucose levels, continuous glucose monitoring, the 101 if you like, plus hopefully dive like a little bit deeper into that. Um, I understand you are the Head of Research and Development at Levels, and uh, you have a medical background, but also with a history or an interest in sort of computers, or at least a computer science. Can you sort of tell us how you ended up at Levels? Uh, yeah, so I've, I've been kind of at the intersection of healthcare and technology for longer than I'd like to admit at this point. It's probably been about 20 years. Um, and, uh, you know, I started off as a software developer, um, went to medical school and uh, initially did a bunch of work in genetics and um, 
started a genetics company actually called Color Genomics. Uh, from there, really got interested in the um, uh, kind of the how, in, in addition to genetics, which tells you about your predisposition for disease, what are the things that we can measure to help you understand where you are on that disease spectrum? And, and how to, what you can do to improve your health. I really got interested in the markers that we could use to help people, give people kind of a mirror of their behavior. And so I really got interested in hormones. I actually started a women's health company for a little while. And then um, it was there that I came across levels and um, talked to Sam and talked to Casey. Uh, there were some experiments that we had actually planned while I was running that other company. And um, when we decided to not pursue it anymore for a couple of reasons that were sort of more related to the product that we had developed, um, I, uh, I decided to come and join Levels because I was so impressed with the team and what they were doing and, and the approach that they were taking. So um, I, I joined full time as the head of research in January. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see. I think my, my mandate uh, is to help us expand beyond glucose and look at all the other things that we can measure to build a general preventive health uh, wellness service. Yeah, that sounds awesome. And of course, you know, the sort of future of levels with expanding that database um, is amazing. But what I found particularly interesting was that actually that really basic understanding of why blood sugar is even important and our ability to measure it and what that's actually telling us. I don't know that that's necessarily something which a lot of people have a good knowledge base on first and foremost really Taylor like I was interested to hear you talk to Dom D'Agostino of a research uh, study that you're conducting or may have already finished looking at actually what is normal glucose levels anyway yeah no absolutely I think we're when it comes to this type of continuous monitoring we're still at ground zero we're we're just learning the basics right now. And actually, the study that you refer, you're referring to is one that we just launched with uh, Dexcom, which is one of the companies that produces the continuous glucose monitors. And what that enables us to do is, you know, help uh, provide people with these sensors and collect data um, for those that consent to participate uh, so that we can learn what these trends really are in the general population. So far, continuous glucose monitoring has really only been used in folks with diabetes to help them manage their disease. And we don't have a good sense yet for what the glucose patterns are in the general population and how they really pertain to your different um, behaviors. What we're learning is that how you, what you eat, how you exercise, um, how your sleep is going even, has a pretty big impact on your glucose level. And so there's a ton that we can learn as well as help people understand about their uh, lifestyle and behaviors uh, from this data. Yeah, because if I think of... Um sort of what quote unquote normal glucose levels are and what I learned sort of going through my nutrition, it's four to eight is other units. And I, I don't know what units, I, I cannot recall how that converts to units um, over in uh, sort of North America. But, you know, if you, your baseline blood sugar should be between four and eight millimoles or eight, maybe after you've um, finished eating a meal or something like that. So how would, um, so if we don't really know what normal is, where does that number come from? Well, so our normal, our quote unquote normal numbers are 70 to 110 or 70 to 130, and that's milligrams per deciliter. So I, I, I I got to remember to do the, I have to, I've got to learn the international units, but let's assume they're the same for the purposes of this conversation. They might not be, but they yeah. you know, hopefully it's close. What we have learned over time is that when, when, um, so if you if you look at a bunch of the large studies that have been done, they've been done with finger sticks. That's that's just sort of one point in time glucose. And when they looked at those point in time numbers, uh, the ones within those ranges tend to be associated with the best long term outcomes. So we know that high glucose, particularly after a meal. So the way we originally defined diabetes was actually by measuring a starting point giving someone a big slug of glucose and then measuring that pinpoint pinprick glucose level two hours after the, after the slug. And your continuous glucose monitor now is, is just looking at it all the time. So you can, we do have some data from the past that we can apply 
to our current situation. And we know that roughly people who were in this quote unquote normal range had the best long term outcomes. The least association with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, we're now finding their associations between things like HbA1c, which is kind of an average glucose level and things like dementia. So there are a bunch of health conditions that we know that are associated with the level of glucose in your blood. Yeah. And also, of course, when I was listening to you and Dom talk about what is normal glucose levels in the general population today, my mind immediately sort of went to, gosh, I wonder how that would compare to, say, 100 years ago, if you were to do this study, you know, compared to, you know, how our life looks now compared to sort of what it was like then. Um, And of course, with, I believe the latest statistic was that 93% of the US are metabolically unhealthy. Like, I wonder, are you going to see any, um, uh, what your information is actually going to sort of bring up when you do this big sort of observational trial? Yeah, no, it, it is. It's super fascinating. I mean, we're we're just at the very beginning, and I think it will be. It'll be interesting to see, you know, how much those normal values really do change. Because right now, we really have the most data around fasting glucose and sort of normal fasting levels. But now, seeing how those levels change over time and what the shape of those changes mean. Um, I think is going to give us a lot of really important information. In terms of how things have changed over the last hundred years, my my favorite reference for that is uh, Michael Pollan. I don't know if you've read any of his books, but like Botany of Desire, Omnivore's Dilemma. Now he's gotten into psychedelics. Um, but his book, Omnivore's Dilemma, I think really laid it down well in 2006, where he initially he talked about the alcohol crisis of the 19th century, um, which was largely generated from corn, and then uh, a comparison to what happened in the U.S. in the 1970s when we really started supporting, uh, from a from a government level, corn production across the U.S., And I think we've now seen that across the world where this glut of corn effectively has changed the food products that we consume. And and I think that's had a massive impact on our carbohydrate intake and on our general health. And so there are a lot of this silent obesity, what was originally called the obesity epidemic, which is now the metabolic health epidemic, um, can really be... um, pinpointed back to these governmental changes in the food supply that were instituted largely in the 1970s. And it's interesting. I've seen a lot of Twitter debates actually on the use of continuous glucose monitors in the general sort of population, like people outside of those who have diabetes. And for whatever reason, there seems to be a real barrier that some physicians have on just quote unquote normal people knowing or having this information where does that come from taylor i mean you might, obviously you see it too <laughs> you're in the industry oh a hundred percent a hundred percent i i think this is um i mean i have a very particular view on this because of my experience in history so uh when i when I built my the, the genetics company that I started back in 2013, um, we were in the same situation with genetics. Um, there were a bunch of physicians and medical geneticists who really did not believe that the general public would be capable of handling their genetic information. This is a group of physicians that had grown up being the gatekeepers and determining who got genetic testing and who didn't. And there were a bunch of people that thought people were going to start jumping off of bridges if we gave them their genetic information. Now, lo and behold, that didn't happen. After there were a few companies out there offering this to the general public, and after it became a much more common thing, those voices started to disappear. But it's not uncommon for physician gatekeepers to have a really hard time with the idea that the general public be given access to something that they have always determined. Yeah. Um, and so I think, and some of that I think comes from, you know, is generally genuinely altruistic. They do see people who have issues with handling the information that comes out of it, um, and making appropriate decisions based on it, right? There, there are guardrails that are required there. The other part that, um, I think they don't talk about as much is for someone who's, livelihood depends on doing a particular job, the idea that that job will disappear is pretty unsettling. 
And I think there are a number of physicians who, uh, you know, they, they are used to this being a big part of their job and, and it's, it's threatening for that to be taken away from them. So I think I wouldn't, I wouldn't underestimate that. I don't advertise that very much, but I think it is a, it's a real thing. Yeah, no, I appreciate what you say with that. Um, so I think there will be people who might not even be familiar at all with the concept of continuous glucose monitoring or have heard of it, but aren't really sure sort of what it is, Taylor. So so let's start the 101, if you like, with why is it even important to think about blood sugar if you don't have diabetes or type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes? Yeah, absolutely. So one way to think about this is it's it's kind of a pulse on your metabolism. And why is metabolism important? Right? Metabolism is something that every single one of the cells in your body goes through. You have somewhere around 50 trillion cells in your body. Every single one of them needs to use glucose, fat, and lactate in order to survive. Right? And, it, and what, what happens is the body regulates those substances very tightly so that all the cells can continue to function. They're very critical for your, your body to function going all the time. And what a glucose level can tell you uh, is, you know, how in tune and how well is the choreography in your body going. The glucose level in your blood is determined by your liver, by your fat, and by your muscle, largely, right, to, to keep it simple. And understanding how those organs are, well, and your, and your pancreas, I, pancreas uh, secretes the insulin. But understanding how that glucose is changing um, gives you a lot of insight uh, as to your how your metabolism is going and how well regulated it is. That, that in turn, so glucose level is linked to a, a host of different diseases. So when that goes awry, when your glucose stops being handled correctly, um, it leads to all kinds of problems. Glucose gets stuck to all different cells in your body and can actually deactivate cells. The increased glucose is, is actually a, a marker of elevated insulin. Um, and too much insulin can do things like uh, stop you from being able to lose weight. It can uh, increase the, you know, the cancer growth in your body. Cancer needs glucose in order to function. So there, there are direct links to a whole host of different diseases. And that's why just measuring this simple number tells you a lot about your general state of health. Okay. And then how does continuous glucose monitoring actually work? So continuous, continuous glucose monitoring is, is the measurement of your blood glucose uh, every couple of seconds for a longer, you know, for the devices that we put out today can measure that for about two weeks. The reason that this is so important for people's health is that we know that that level of blood sugar is correlated with a number of different conditions and diseases. And so monitoring that over time can give you a lot of information about your risk. Um, And we're seeing conversely in the new data that we're collecting that it can be associated, there are patterns that are associated with better and worse health. So does levels provide that every second analysis or or as a, uh, a user, do we get it every 15 minutes or something? So I'm just thinking about what I saw with my CGM as to how often, literally every couple of seconds, it's we're in there looking at our glucose. So the, the, the mechanism by which the data is obtained is different for, for the two devices. So if you use the Abbott device, it requires you to manually scan, and you'll only get data every time you manually scan. Uh, if you use the Dexcom device, it's uploaded every five minutes. So the the... And the app always updates in real time. Uh, so, but, but I think realistically, the, the best you can hope for is about a five to 10 minute delay. Um, with the Abbott device, you have to scan. And how well does that uh, glucose in that um, interstitial fluid correlate with, say, a glucometer or what you might get if you get a fasting or just a, a blood glucose um, measure from the laboratory? There's, there's a little bit of variability by device, but um, in general, what they've found is it's within a few seconds you get, uh, or sorry, a few minutes, you get reasonable correlation. Um, and it's usually it's between 10 to 15%. Uh, 
uh, if I were to take a blood glucose at a particular point in time and look at the interstitial fluid at that same point in time, I might see a difference, but it would, it should, um, it should come together within a few minutes. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're off by a few minutes, but they, they come together very quickly. Okay. And then, I mean, you mentioned why it's important to know about blood sugar levels for your sort of general healthy person. What can they do with the information? Like what is the most practical sort of application if I was to put one on my arm? And I have actually done. Like what is your sort of, yeah, recommendation with, with how someone might even use it? Well, um, you know, I, I think that when, when we look across the folks that join Levels, the um, what we see most often is when people put on the glucose monitor within a day or two, they see that their glucose really spikes with some particular meal that they've eaten, some particular food. Um, the one that the co-founders Sam and Josh always talk about is oatmeal, um, where they you know every we've we've said for decades that oatmeal is good for you, right? And the glucose data shows otherwise, right? When when they put a glucose patch on, they saw that their glucose shot through the roof. And then it actually shot back down and they were getting this, uh, it was, it's kind of like a, a sugar crash or a hangover uh, afterwards from these oats, which have a lot of, um, depending on how, you know, how they're prepared, they have carbohydrates, a ton of refined carbohydrates. And, and that I think is the, exactly the issue is people start to see really quickly what foods are changing their glucose in ways that they weren't expecting. Well, it's interesting, Taylor, because I was at, I studied, so here in um, Southern Hemisphere, there were two labs that looked at glycemic index. So there's a University of Sydney, uh, Jenny Brand Miller's lab, uh, and then also down at Otago, we we ran um, some studies there right in the early days, sort of like in the late 90s. And I um, and my me and my masters, uh, other friends who were doing our masters at the time, would go along to the lab and they would feed us the equivalent to 50 grams of glucose or carbohydrate and assess how the um, what our blood sugars would do over the course of two hours to determine the glycemic index of that particular food. Which, of course, as I know you'll be familiar with, this is then now a, a concept that then went into the sort of nutrition health space and sort of stayed around for, you know, a good couple of decades. And I still see people referring to it now, health professionals referring to it now. What does the CGM data and just what we understand about individual variability, how does that almost sort of contradict the glycemic index? Like where does that put the glycemic index, do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, I think fundamentally – and this is the big shocker for most people, like diet is very individual. How, how foods affect you are very, it's very personal. Um, we we don't all respond the same. The idea of, of a, an index, it's, I, I think it's, um, it, it's tricky. It, there, there, there's so much variability. And, and I, this is something I know from genetics, Look, greater than 50% of human variation occurs at less than 1% frequency, which tells you we're an incredibly outbred population, right? So most that, you know, we're all diff very different from each other. And, and that shows up in how we metabolize food. Some people have more or less of the enzymes that break down specific carbohydrates into sugars. Some, some of those enzymes work better than others or worse than others. The way people's systems are primed, they may or may not take in those sugars, right? It may not get through the intestinal wall and it may or may not then get converted into something in the liver or in the adipose tissue. So there are all these, there's so many steps to this process and there's so much variability that I think what would be really interesting is to look at, let's take a bunch of foods that are both low and high glycemic index and try it on say 50 or hundred people with CGM and see what the variability is. Yes. I'll bet that it's so big that you wouldn't be able to really, there's no one number that captures any one food. Yeah, so interesting. And Taylor, when you first used a continuous glucose monitor, did you get any surprises from the foods that you ate? Yeah, actually, uh, I, I, you know, I wish my story was a little bit more uh, unique, but well, so one, one thing I will say is I wasn't, I could eat a ton of ice cream. Um, so I was pretty excited about that. <laughs> Not that I did 
but uh, the, uh, <laughs> the 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 thing that really shocked me again it was a, it was an oat cereal it was uh, Barbara's it was a you know a, a heart healthy oat cereal that I had bought at the store that really shot my glucose up to like two thirty or two forty and I thought wow how is this possible um, the 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 thing that on on a second um, try really uh, influenced me too, though, was that the variability from day to day is pretty high. How you sleep in, in, uh, has an impact on how high it goes. Um, what you ate just before the particular carbohydrate has an impact. So, and we have blog posts on this, uh, eating chia seed, uh, chia seeds before you eat, let's say a croissant has a big impact on how high that glucose spike goes. Whether you go for a walk after you ate, has a big impact on that glucose spike. So there's so many variables that can impact whether you get a spike, how high it is, um, really, you know, how your metabolism works. Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned chia seeds and I'm sort of tangenting going into questions I would have asked a little bit later, but since you brought it up, so we've got chia seeds will change the spike. So is it that they will, it will lower the glycemic in impact of the croissant, for example? Yes. So think having proteins, fatty acids, uh, at the same time or prior to carbohydrates can really abrogate or really diminish uh, or reduce the, the spike that you get. Yeah. Um, f- fiber can be really helpful because it can prevent uh, glucose uptake in the, in the intestine. So there are, you know, leafy greens, things like that can be very helpful. Um, when you think about the the, the way a traditional Mediterranean meal might be plated, you start with salad and then you move on to the main course, which has some carbohydrate and meat in it. If you, if you eat things in that order, you actually uh, reduce the glucose spike that your body will experience. Yeah. Taylor, I've heard of the sort of the second meal effect as well. So sort of starting with like, you know, if you have a breakfast that's quite high in protein, then that will change how your body responds to food later in the day as well have you seen that in any of your data is that or is that how you understand it as well it is how i understand it i'm not sure how long that effect lasts i think i think the in general the um the substances have to be in the intestine at the same time so you know as if if you eat a high protein breakfast but then you eat a bunch of carbs for lunch i think there's there may still be a spike. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it really depends on, on how close in time they are. Um, what we do see is a spike takes about an hour to form. So in general, if you eat within an hour, um, you, can, you can see an impact. Um, but we don't, I mean, this is why this study is going to be so interesting, right? We'll start to get some real answers to these things. Uh, you know, how, how far apart can you eat and, and see a spike? You know, how much of an impact does a, an all-nighter cause on your glucose levels? Um, what about your, you know, whether, how much you're exercising? Does a, does a high intensity class impact your, the, the meal spike you might have? Um, the other thing that's really interesting is we're finding that there are different types of spikes that happen outside of eating food. So, uh, for instance, I'm actually very prone to stress spikes. When I have, a, when I get acutely stressed about something, my glucose can spike up to 130 or 150. Um, that's very different from a food spike. It goes up within five minutes and it goes down within five minutes. Whereas a food spike takes about an hour to form and an hour to resolve. And with that stress spike, Taylor, did you do you also see the subsequent sort of below your normal uh, level, or does it sort of just pop up and sh- and come back down? You know, because often what I find with a, with foods that spiked me, and I had a couple of interesting ones which I'll talk about in a minute. But what I noticed is that it came down and it just continued to fall, and that's when and I I didn't need a CGM to tell me that because I could feel that with regards to I started sort of sweating a little bit and getting lightheaded and nauseous and all those sort of symptoms. Oh wow, yeah, I I haven't experienced that. But again, this is where there's so much variability, right? Uh, that's really neat. So, so after you 
experienced a stress spike, you you actually had a hypoglycemic. Oh, n- kind of not period. after a stress. After I had a keto product, actually. So that's because that's oh, yeah. That's the oh. other thing which um, which I noticed when I did my CGM is that I had like there were these lovely protein bars and I love them. They're called no cow bars and they're vegan and they're dairy free. Yeah, I'm not vegan or dairy free, but regardless, they're still this, you know, health halo. Um, and they have four grams of net carbohydrate, but of course they've got, I think the fiber is called isomalto oligosaccharide or something. So it's a, a type of fiber that's put in a lot of keto-based products so they can say, you know, it only is four grams net carb. Um, but it still spiked my blood sugar up to, to I think, about eight or nine, actually, which wow. is quite high. And it was it was the, oh, I'm pretty, it was nothing else out that would have been in the bar that would have done it. So I assume, because I did it a couple of times, it was the fiber in the bar. Um, and I think that's something which would be interesting for people to have sort of some indication of as well. So you have the quote unquote healthy foods like oatmeal, which we think should be good for us. But now you've got all these products that might be coming to market sort of, you know, professing to be low carb or, you know, not supposed to have an impact yet. That might not necessarily be the case, I guess. Absolutely. No, I think one thing that will be really interesting is, um, is looking at these, I I think there's a, a, um, some open space here to actually evaluate a bunch of products, right. To, 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 you know, try them out, see what impact they have. I think that the key is to have at least 10 or maybe even a hundred people try out each different product because of the variation that people experience. But yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's true. I, I think I have always loved resolving conflicts with data and, um, I think, you know, we were able to do some of that in genetics. I think we'll be able to do a lot with respect to diet. Yeah, yeah. uh, With continuous monitoring. Yeah, sure. So, so Taylor, you mentioned um, chia seeds as a way to lower that uh, glucose spike. Have you seen, I imagine you've seen loads of um, people sort of anecdotal or case sort of studies uh, reports. Have you seen cinnamon or raw apple cider vinegar used to the same extent? Well, so it's interesting you say that we're we're actually we have a a vinegar challenge that we're doing right now with CGM. So we'll have some more data on that soon. Um, the, you know, I think each of these things it's it's too early to say definitively, right? I think with chia seeds, you know, we're starting to say it because we've seen it in a bunch of different folks, but you know, we're really just getting to the point where we've collected enough data to say there's a definitive impact. Um, But yes, we expect that balsamic and apple cider vinegar will uh, abrogate, or sorry, will reduce some of those spikes, as well as uh, things like chia seed, as well as, you know, nuts. There there are a number of other things that people have uh, identified over time that should work based on what we understand metabolism. I think the... um, It'll be interesting to see how many of them actually do when it when we when we get to the other side of it. Yeah, totally. I totally agree. Um, you mentioned sleep, and or obviously you mentioned stress, which um, is an interesting and and probably a um, or could be a big mover for a lot of people. Um, what is the impact you've seen with sleep deprivation, Taylor? Well, th- so there there are a couple of mechanisms that people have postulated where. Um, sleep deprivation increases your insulin resistance. That is, it basically decreases the amount that your tissues such as muscle and adipose respond to insulin Mm. that's produced. Mm -hmm. And what that means is for folks who are in a sleep deprived state is the glucose spikes will be exacerbated. So you might ingest something, your pancreas produces a bunch of insulin, but your tissue is like, ah, I can't, I can't pay attention right now. I'm too tired. And so the insulin levels in your bloodstream may go higher or they may stay higher for a longer period of time. And um, that that's, I think some of that's been borne out so far. The, the big confounder is that it's so hard to measure someone's sleep. Right. It's it's so hard to measure how well someone slept. And so that, I think, is going to be the difficulty in making these 
correlations more precise. Yeah. I wonder though, because you're right, it's hard to get that sort of objective data. And obviously you've got WHOOP and you've got Aura, but there are some questions as to how much that can really tell you. But even, do people not know when they just don't have a great night's sleep? Like, I'm not sure. Like I think, you know, a couple of nights ago I had a rubbish sleep and I, you know, I knew it because I could feel that I was in a light sleep almost, you know, the entire night. And I, that, I guess that individual sort of perception um, has got to play a role somewhere No, in, in helping inform that. No, definitely. Well, I, I think, you know, the way we really think about our service is helping people improve that sense of interoception. So that sense that you feel about how, how am I really doing, right? That sense of, oh, you know, I don't feel great because I didn't sleep that well. We think of glucose monitoring and, and, you know, heart rate and temperature and the other things that people are doing as a way to sort of uh, increase your ability to, to sense that feeling, right? Um, to sense how you're doing. And I think, you know, what would be interesting in this case is to, to ask some questions and say, hey, how did you feel you slept? And see if that correlates with the changes in your glucose. Because it, it very well may. I wouldn't be surprised if it does. Um, I, I just haven't, again, I haven't seen the data, right? Like yes. it, it makes, you know, it makes a lot of sense. And I, I wouldn't be surprised to see that correlation, but I haven't actually seen it. Yet. Yeah. Okay. So as a um, practitioner, I often say to people that like, if you've had a rubbish night's sleep, then maybe one of, like a couple of the things you can do is train in a fasted state in the morning, nothing particularly hard, but get some steady state sort of cardio work going because that may well improve your blood sugar control or at least reduce down your glucose, your fasting glucose, which I also caveat by saying it might be higher because you haven't slept because most people haven't measured it, but I just sort of, you know, caveat that. Uh, and then also I suggest to them to have a lower carb diet that day. So they're hopefully avoiding um, the some of those sort of issues with sugar management. Uh, good strategies, Taylor? Absolutely. I think um, in, in general, we've seen that uh, lowering the, your carbohydrate intake is the best way to reduce your average blood sugar. And uh, you know, I, I think whether whether or not that night of sleep impacted you, just to be safe, having fewer carbs that day will definitely help you. Yeah, out. which is you know completely incongruent with all of the dietary guidelines in the Western world, really. And I find this this is interesting, <laughs> is not to get political, but slightly. And again, this is a bit of a tangent, but you know, if you do have like ninety three percent of the population metabolically challenged. And you have dietary guidelines suggesting that the healthy individual get at least six say, serves of you know whole grains a day. Like it's just such a it's it's just such a mismatch there. I think with regards to what actually might be better advice for the general population. No, it's a great point. I mean, I think in the same way that. Uh, t to be honest, I think, you know, the, the health pyramid as well as the, you know, the corn glut that we currently have and the, you know, increased amount of wheat, all of those things started from a good place. I think the, you know, we, we started growing corn and wheat to help feed the rest of the world and to make sure people didn't go hungry, right? We started a food pyramid and made it a part of the sort of general dietary recommendations so people would know what to eat and, and so that they would be able to eat in a, in a healthy way. Now, th those things have been perverted uh, on the one hand, because now that we have a glut of corn, we have we have to figure out what to do with it. And industry has been incredibly good at finding new routes and new things to do with that corn. At the same time, you've seen, you know, the U.S. Dairy Association, the Corn Growers Association, the wheat, you know, all the all the uh, associations of, of farmers and, and growers advocate for their the things the the products that they have and i think you know unfortunately the the food pyramid has been built more by farmers than it has by physicians and and you know i think we would do well to revisit that yeah. in light of what we currently know yeah so it, i find it interesting and, and i suppose it's that any change there is going to be so slow and 
almost like you know how sometimes when you look at some things that change like if you don't see something for five years they seem to have changed you know things seem to change quite a lot compared to what you sort of see every day and I wonder whether that might be a little bit like the food pyramid which isn't a pyramid anymore of course but you know like maybe the dietary guidelines will actually look quite different in 50 years time as things slowly change sort of you know that we might not even be so aware of then again that's a complete tangent of you know some of my main questions um one of them is taylor what about alcohol what have you seen from all of the data coming through about how alcohol impacts blood sugar because i was quite surprised to see what i saw on my cgm so interestingly alcohol seems to interfere with the liver's production of glucose and um, it can actually reduce uh, a postprandial a, a, a spike after you eat. Um, it, it can also reduce the liver's output of sugar more generally. The way that I have heard this described, um, and I'm not an expert in that area, but a, a way that I've heard it described is that the, uh, the, the liver can only process a certain amount each time. You can sort of think about the liver as a bathtub that you're pouring a bunch of stuff in. And it, there's only a certain amount that can come out the drain at the same time. So if you're pouring a bunch of, of alcohol in at the same time as you're pouring a bunch of glucose in, only some of that is going to come out at once. And um, I certainly have seen it personally. And I think, you know, we've talked about this extensively at the company that folks who drink alcohol while they eat do see uh, a a reduction in the amount of spikes that they get in their their glucose. Now, we, we actually postulate that it's it's giving it's actually increasing the amount of fat that's being produced. Uh, and we're, you know, I, I think there's some speculation around um, what that what that looks like. So we don't want to say that drinking a lot of alcohol while you eat is is healthy for you because we don't we, we actually don't think it is. Um, but but it does seem like there may be a happy middle ground somewhere around sort of the one to two drink range um, with a meal where having a little bit of alcohol while you're uh, consuming foods that are high in carbohydrates might actually be good for you. Yeah, it's interesting because I was in fact drinking wine and having like French fries at the same time, the thick variety, not those funny thin ones, you know, and I was I'm like, ah, oh, my, this is actually having a positive impact on my blood sugar, not necessarily thinking it was good for my health, but thinking, well, you know, maybe it could be worse. I'm not sure. Um, one thing though, Taylor, I'm interested in, and you may or may not have data on this at levels, but have you seen any um, changes or any correlation between COVID, between long COVID or vaccines or anything like that in blood sugar? Like, do we know anything there? And I know that anything that you might suggest might will just be sort of anecdotal or whatever, but there's definitely a correlation between um, the impact of COVID or the, you know, the, the severity of the d- disease and blood sugar levels, right? We know that folks who have diabetes are at much higher risk for severe COVID, which includes hospitalization and death, right? And that's been known for a little while. And it's interesting. It's actually both ways. Uh, it turns out that those with diabetes are at higher risk of severe COVID and vice versa, those who have had COVID actually are more likely to get diabetes. And that's that's more tentative. But there's a so there's clearly a connection here. Now, the risks associated with having diabetes and I'm re- reading here from a post from Janaki Vakaria at Mass General Hospital. Um, and, you know, what she starts with is to say, you know, it, it's not that people with diabetes are more likely to get COVID but it is that people with diabetes are more likely to have complications from a COVID diagnosis. And the reason for that is they think that it's, it's due to an impaired immune system or elevated inflammation, right? So two of the things that we know that chronically elevated blood sugars do are number one, the, the sugar itself impacts cells, right? So you can imagine a higher blood sugar level means that more of your immune cells are getting sugar stuck to their receptors, which inactivates them, right? So that that impairs the immune system. Separately from that, what we see is that those with high average blood glucose also have uh, certain types of inflammation that are more active. 
the, the, the mechanism there is a little bit less sure, but that chronic inflammation can be tipped over into a severe COVID infection. And so, you know, the, the risk of um, having a severe infection and even dying from COVID comes from having your immune system overreact and, and basically drown your lungs. So that, that I think is the link between elevated inflammation that diabetics experience and uh, COVID. Now, on the flip side, um, for those who got COVID, um, that, that what, what is the mechanism by which they can get diabetes? That is not clear. I think, it's, I think they're more likely to get type 2 diabetes. Um, and so this is not yet generalizable, but there was a large study done in 180,000 people, mostly white men, showing that the increased risk of uh, diabetes is actually not limited to the short term. Um, it starts about a month after COVID disease and for the 12 months following. And it's interesting, during that time, people were 40% more likely to have a new diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Keep in mind, this is just one study, yeah, yeah. but it's like, that's a, that's a significant relative, you know, increase in the relative risk. The risk of diabetes goes up in those who are more severely affected by COVID-19, i.e. those who were hospitalized or admitted to an ICU. And uh, the, the higher their uh, starting weight, the, the higher the, the subsequent risk. So clearly um, there's, there's a link to sort of uh, obesity as well. Okay, so here are the mechanisms by which it's possible. This is this is very uh, much debated. Um, so it may it COVID nineteen um, may uh, stimulate your immune system. So it's a it's basically an autoimmune reaction that causes a severe COVID nineteen response. That revving up of your immune system may make it more likely that your immune system attacks your pancreas. And then they're saying how you know. Uh, weight gain and stress might be sort of predisposing and those that have been severely impacted aren't, they're not getting enough exercise, et cetera. So I think the, the mechanisms here are still very tentative, but it's interesting to see a link on both sides, right? Those who have diabetes are more likely to get severe COVID and those who have had COVID are actually more likely to get diabetes. Yeah. So there, there is a, a very interesting link between, I would say what we're, what we're seeing here is kind of general inflammation and, uh, you know, blood sugar. What I find really interesting with the with blood sugar with um A one C and the sort of laboratory cutoffs is, you know, you mentioned um that the article stated something about having just elevated blood sugar could contribute to um sort of complications. And 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 I guess it's comes back to sort of what we we're talking about at the start of the call is, you know, what are pe what are people's blood sugars like just in everyday life? You know, a lot of people have an A1C. Um, in here in New Zealand, it's HbA1c, and the cutoff is forty-one. And someone might go to their doctor, and their HbA1c might be forty, and they're like, "Well, you know, that's a little high." Thirty-nine though gets a sort of doesn't seem to really sort of get a red flag, and it's like there's not this. It feels a little bit arbitrary, really, that someone might be. Um, you know, not be at risk at just a slightly lower blood sugar. And I think this is another reason why having this information could be so helpful for people to be able to have that sort of uh, proactive uh, response to some of their health indicators, I guess. No, definitely. I think, you know, what, what continuous glucose monitoring really gives you that you just don't get from any other tests that you get at your doctor is the ability to see how your behaviors are impacting yeah. things, right? I could get a high A1C and I, I don't know where I should start. Should I start by changing my diet in certain ways? Should I start by changing exercise, sleep, stress? I don't really know. But if I have a glucose monitor, I can actually see what, when and what in my life is causing that elevated sugar. And, and that, I think, is what's so powerful about the real-time monitoring. Yeah. Is it, it allows you to tie your health to your lifestyle. Yeah, right. absolutely. Taylor, do you see any um, sex-based differences in glucose levels or, or any changes in and around the menstrual cycle? Like, has your data, uh, is your data set sort of large enough and have, has it been explored enough to tease out anything like that? No, 
unfortunately not. We're, we're just, you know, I think I would love to chat again in six months because I think we'll have some interesting results there. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, there are some things that we do know. Um, glucose, so that, that same um, enzyme that I was talking about earlier, hormone-sensitive lipase, does seem to be, well, and, and these tissues in general are responsive to estrogen. Um, and so, and we know that women, as they enter uh, perimenopause and menopause, experience real extreme changes in their estrogen levels. And that changes the way their metabolism is handled um, by their fat tissue. It changes the fat distribution, all kinds of things. So we do know that there's a, a link between the sex steroids and the um, handling of glucose, particularly with estrogen. Um, that and and you know, so what we see in in uh, menstruating females is that during the luteal phase, women tend to be a little bit more insulin resistant. So it's it's you know there are uh, changes across the cycle uh, that are important to know about, and um, you know it's interesting when you start combining things like your glucose monitoring with temperature monitoring or with, you know, if, if for those that use something like Clue or Flow, an app to track your cycles, you can see how um, your glucose actually changes over the course of a month and how it fluctuates around your period. Yeah, yeah for sure. Now, um, finally, before I ask you just a little bit more about your Levels app, which I don't believe we have available here in New Zealand. Hopefully soon, yeah. And we actually have a... Um, I'm not sure if this is how we got connected, but we do have an employee over in um, in uh, New Zealand who has been a great advocate for us. Oh, so amazing. Soon. Oh, I did not know that. That is great. Um, well, I, that's good. We've got someone on the ground floor sort of like um, uh, advocating for it. Um, do we know anything about um, glucose levels and mental health outcomes? Or, you know, like that's, you know, physical health is obviously super important, but mental health, there's a lot more these days, sort of awareness and um, appreciation for how lifestyle, how food impacts that. Um, can you give us any insights? Yeah, so there, there's a whole there's a whole field that's forming now around um, carbohydrate metabolism and psychological health. Um, and it's, it's kind of born out of the ketogenic movement. Um, and actually one of our advisors, Dom D'Agostino is really helping to foster this movement. Um, but you know, there's some basic observations that we've been able to make for a long time. Depression, for instance, is over twice, uh, as common among type two diabetics as, as it is in the general population. Uh, and there are a couple of different mechanisms by which people have postulated that um, you could see changes in kind of serotonin receptors uh, and serotonin processing uh, with with high versus low glucose. So yes, there does seem to be a link there. Um, now that that's tied into body image and you know how people feel about themselves more generally. So these are complex things that are difficult to tease apart. Um, but certainly there does seem to be a link between how your your glucose metabolism, I would say, is working and your mental health state. Yeah. And also, of course, if you think practically with regards to, you know, if someone is, has elevated blood sugars in a carbohydrate dominant diet, then making the switch mm -hmm. to incorporate more fat, more protein, it's like opportunity cost, isn't it? Like, so suddenly you have a lot more nutrients coming in that might support mental health and neurotransmitter balance and and um how your receptors sort of work and and all that kind of thing versus uh so it's not just what you're taking out and what you're changing there it's what's going in and and what's sort of aiding the process too i guess yeah well yeah i mean we've been sort of focusing on the macronutrients right fat versus carbohydrates etc and there are a number of different nutrients that are really important for a balanced diet um, I, I always go back to Michael Pollan for this one too. I, I really like his summary, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. And I, I think, you know, thinking of that, the, the, the plants, the veg vegetables that you eat uh, really add a lot to your body's ability to function, right? You need a certain number of these different vitamins, minerals, things like that in order for your cells to function optimally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Taylor, with regards to the Levels app then, um, you mentioned sort of at the start of the call that you're looking to develop it further to sort of add in other bits. So, so 
I guess my first question is, where is it available? Uh, and secondly, what does it measure? And I guess, finally, what are you hoping to expand on there? Mm, sure. Well, so Levels is really a software company that helps people understand first and foremost how food affects their health. Um, it, it, the company develops a mobile application that leverages data from continuous glucose monitors, um, as well as a number of other biosensors um, in order for people to uh, be able to better understand their health, right? It's this interoception or this mirror that we were talking about. Developing that um, is really at the core of what the company hopes to do. Uh, the Currently, now, I, I haven't checked this. It might actually be possible to download the Levels app without becoming a full Levels member. And, and the, the, it will ingest data from other sources, but you won't be able to use the continuous glucose monitoring. So you can't use that aspect of the of the app yeah. right now. Is it a Dexcom um, that you guys um, use? Is 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 that the the model that Levels is attached to? Is it Libra or? It's it's both. So the company we we we're agnostic as to the specific sensor you use. You can use both uh, Abbott as well as Dexcom, and and it's just you know if you are in the uh, continental or sorry in the United States more broadly. Um, if you're a U.S. resident, uh, you can sign up for Levels, and then you can you can use either Abbott or uh, Dexcom. Yeah, yeah. And are you um, bringing in um, uh, Whoop or Aura? Are you in sort of comms with them about bringing data in from those? We develop partnerships with a number of different companies. Currently, what we're doing is importing data from Apple Health Kit. So if you allow us to connect to your Apple Health Kit, any health data that, that comes into Apple Health Kit will be merged with your um, continuous glucose data or uh, ideally. Uh, and, and so, for instance, when I look at my Levels app, my, my, the, my runs and my walks and things like that will show up on the app so that I can, I can see how those activities actually relate to my, my glucose level. Um, the app also gives you the ability to log different types of events. So I can log food, I can log exercise, I can log other types of events, and it really helps me understand my sort of total picture. Yeah, for sure. And actually, and I said um, my final question, but I, I am interested in, in this one final question, is of course there are things like exercise which do impact your sugar levels and they spike them up and bring them down, you know, when you do a, like a hip session or, or, you know, a hard run or whatever. Um, it, you know, I always find it interesting, like how the body would know the difference between a hard spike from exercise. I guess all the other physiology that occurs alongside it makes it a healthy thing for the body compared to say, um, you know, a big bag of uh, pretzels, for example. Well, so those, those two events are actually quite different. The, um, and, and they're mediated by different things. This is why I think hormones are so interesting. So when you, uh, when you undergo strenuous exercise, there are a number of signals that show up in the bloodstream that tell the liver to start effectively just dumping glucose in, right? So you get this massive glucose spike, which enables your muscles to function optimally for short periods of time, undergo glycolysis, and actually the lactate then gets used by local muscles in order to be able to get as much fuel as they as it can out of uh, what, what's being released into the bloodstream. The, um, the, the time scale of that spike is actually quite different from the time scale of a postprandial spike. The, the time scale of a hit spike or a, a strenuous exercise spike is usually on the order of you know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, however long you're, you're really strenuously exercising. Tw 20 minutes actually would even be very, quite long for such a spike. Whereas a postprandial spike from a bag of pretzels is going to you know, take about an hour to, to start and it'll stay high for another hour, hour and a half before it goes down. And so what you're talking about are, are very different timescales under which your body's experiencing these elevated levels of glucose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes perfect sense as you sort of like illustrate that, of course. Yeah. Um, Taylor, thank you so much for your time. Now I understand like the Levels website with the, the blogs, they're such good educational resources for people to go in and have a, you know, a much broader read on not just uh, glucose uh, and monitoring glucose levels, but just metabolic health and health in general. Uh, 
and the podcast that Levels also produces. So can you just give us um, a couple of the links? And of course, I'll put them in the show notes as to where people can find more information. Yeah, absolutely. So our, as you said, I think our Levels Health blog does a really great job of putting this all into con- into the context of metabolic health, talking about all the different aspects of metabolic health and how that impacts you um, and how it relates to continuous glucose monitoring. So levelshealth.com, I think it's slash blog, is um, where you can find a lot of those materials. And then the show is called A Whole New Level. And we've been putting out a couple episodes a week. And it's, it's about all different things related to the company. So there are some that are related to metabolic health. There are some that are related to building a company. Um, I put out a, uh, an episode recently on resilience, um, which is really more of a forward-thinking concept related to general preventive health. Um, there's a, a, a range of things on there, but some really great content. Um, if you want to do a deep dive on any one of the sort of metabolic health topics, I would head over to a whole new level and find one of those shows. That is awesome, Taylor, and I will pop links to that in the show notes. And in fact, I listened to that resiliency episode and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really, yeah, it made a lot of good sense and it really was um, good sort of food for thought, if you like. Um, Taylor, thank you so much for your time this morning. I really appreciate it. And um, uh, I'm really looking forward to that the research that you've got underway sort of the results coming to light because I think that understanding this area more both as a practitioner and also just as a general sort of person interested in health um, can't really come soon enough so um, yeah thank you so much thank you it was really a pleasure talking with you Mickey Alrighty, so, you know, it's super interesting to chat to Taylor given my own experience as we discussed with those CGM monitors and it's great that they are now sort of creating tools that allow us to interpret this in light of other things that are going on like our stress levels, like the exercise we do and all of that other data analysis, so um, it's super cool, even if you're not necessarily a data geek. Next week on the podcast... I have the pleasure of chatting to Julianne Taylor, registered nutritionist and colleague, a close friend and someone who is a mentor to me as well, all about her work in the nutrition space and also being New Zealand's national champion in powerlifting at the age of 62, which is quite a remarkable feat. All right, team, until next time, have a great week.